your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn to the book of 1 Timothy again, chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and uh, we will finish up this um, message entitled, Get a Grip on Godly Living, Get a Grip on Godly Living. Let's all stand tonight, and we'll look there, down in verse 12 as our text tonight, out of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. It says there, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Fight the good fight. How many know that that's really our goal in life is every day to fight the good fight when it comes to our Christian life? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight. Now, you've noticed we've not had choir on Sunday night. The reason being is because they are practicing so hard, trying to get ready for all of this Christmas cantata that they don't have a a lot of time, you know, to practice other things. So that's what they're doing. They're practicing their Christmas stuff. And uh, let's see, not this next week, but the next week, they'll have that and we'll have a good time. Well, let's thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Father, we love you and we lift you up and we magnify you. You're worthy of our praise and tonight we come to you and ask you to bless us once again with your presence father come down and be with us we give you the right through the holy spirit to do whatever you want to do here tonight touch our lives touch our hearts help us to never be the same because we've heard your word and been taught your word father we'll praise you forevermore for what you do because you're a good god in your precious name we pray these things in the name of jesus All God's people said. Now shake somebody's hand before you sit down there and tell them you love them. That's one of our favorite songs around here. Never get tired of hearing that, amen? Good song. Well, talking about getting a grip on our godly living, this morning we talked about some factors in that. And one of the things that we talked about is that there are several titles for us as Christian people, Christian men and women. One of those titles is found in Matthew 5.13 where it says there you're the salt of the earth. And then in Matthew 5.14 which says you are the light of the world. And that's what God says about you and me. And that's what he says we need to be. We need to be these things in a lost and dying world so that other people can see Jesus, so that other people can know Jesus. But then here in these verses, in 1 Timothy 6, 11, he gives us another title that we bear, and and it says there, but thou, O man of God. As I told you this morning, that is talking to you ladies too, because it really is translated into the part of belonging. So you and I belong to God. We're His as Christian men and women. So there it is talking to us about belonging to the family of God. And that belonging to the family of God, we should be men and women of God. Also, we talked about the first thing that these responsibilities as being a Christian that They are centered around three verbs that we talked about this morning. And the first is that we are to flee from some things. He says there in 1 Timothy 6, 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Now that word flee there has a tremendous meaning because it says to go away from or to Translated, one has put it this way, flee and keep on fleeing or separate and keep on separating yourself. In other words, it's a lifestyle. God is saying to us, it ought to be a lifestyle to flee from some of these things that are not right in this old wicked world. Separate ourselves from them. Get away from these things. We used three men this morning. I won't talk about that anymore, but we used three men to exemplify that. But then he goes on here in these verses, Paul does, and 
he uh, recognizes two areas of concern in a Christian's life that we have to really watch. The first concern was false doctrine. And as I said this morning, belief does determine our behavior. If we believe and love the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to behave like it. But we live in a world tonight that really doesn't behave like it. But God wants us to, and He means for us to. He talks about false doctrine here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. He says, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So he says that we need to watch out for false doctrine. Then he talks about godless practices. In verse 5 of 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says this. He says, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth. He said, there are just some wicked people out there that will try to deceive you. Amen. That they're godless. Yeah, that they act like they know God and they don't know God. He said, watch those things. Because those things will get you in trouble. How many of you know tonight, if you're saved that you have the Spirit of God in you, and God gives you that discernment. You know uh, who is right and who's not right. I believe that with all my heart, because God gives us that. He lets us know our brothers and sisters in Christ. And then he goes on down to say that if we are going to be a godly man or woman, uh, in 2 Timothy he says that we ought to flee youthful lust, and I'll let you just uh, think about that for a moment. And then he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. Flee these things. Run away from them. Separate yourself from these things. But tonight, I want to talk about a second area. He says in 1 Timothy 6, 11, he says the same words to us, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and read those two words with me. And what? And follow. You see, as Christians, we have to follow something. It's not our own selves. Amen? Amen. It's not other uh, people. We follow God. And there is a way tonight to follow God. It's just not by what I say or what you say. It's by what God says through His Word. And how many of you know tonight that His Word is truth? It's the truth. No fallacies in it, no lies in it. It's truth. You can believe it all the way. Everything you read in the Word of God, you can live by it. You can know it. And God gave it to us for that reason, is that we need to follow some things. Now I want to give you a few uh, uh, definitions of these words. That, that word follow there, in this context, means to pursue. It really translates dico, which means to press towards, or to press in, or to press on. That's what it means. Every day of our life, God is saying to us that to follow Him means to press in, to press on, to keep fighting the good fight, to keep going forward. Don't back up. How many of you know tonight, you don't have to back up when it comes to Christ and the calling of God on our lives. We don't have to back up not one inch. We go forward. We move forward. Forward, we press in, we press on. It's kind of a picture here to describe a runner in hot pursuit, uh, you know, of reaching the finish line, of grabbing the tape as they cross the finish line. As I was thinking about this also, it's a picture of straining and striving and, and accuracy and stretching towards. Uh, the mark, uh, uh, the finish of, of the race. But also, I thought of it as a football term. 
I don't know if any of you watch football, but sometimes, you know, when they get close to the goal line, I mean, those old boys now, I'm telling you right now, you better be a tough guy if you're going to keep one of them out of the end zone. Because that's their goal. Their goal is to put that ball over that line. Their goal is to get into the end zone and score. And they stretch towards it. And they, they, they use their body in, in, in all different ways, shapes and forms, to get into that end zone. Jump, leap, head first, whatever it takes. They get into the end zone. And that's what the picture is here of us as we are in this Christian life. We're stretching for the finish line. We're running. It's our goal. We're going to get there. We're going to score and get the prize. We're pursuing something. We are following after something. Paul uses a present tense verb here, uh, which should be translated to pursue and keep on pursuing every day of our life. We get up with the thought on our mind that we're going to follow and keep on following, pursue and keep on pursuing this Christian life. This is not just something that we are reacting to. It's not just something, uh, you know, a play acting in our life. It is a real, true conversion of the Lord Jesus Christ that lives inside of you. It is your whole life to pursue this. That's what God is saying right there. Pursue it and keep on pursuing these things in your life. He lists here, Paul does, some things we are to keep pursuing. Look at what they are, verse 11. Let me get a drink. My mouth is really dry tonight. Right here, in verse 11, here's some things that we keep pursuing. The first two are righteousness and godliness. God says while we're running towards the finish line, while we're jumping to get into the end zone, as we're stretching and striving for that mark, he said in this call of life, we are to pursue and keep pursuing righteousness and godliness. Are you doing that tonight? Or has it become a kind of a flippant way to live for you? Oh, I'm a Christian, you know, I go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night, I read my Bible every now and then. Or is it a lifestyle? A lifestyle of righteousness, a lifestyle of godliness. In that context there, these two words refer to our relationship with God. In other words, these words speak of what our relationship directly is with God. Righteousness and and godliness. We only get that from Him. I can't produce that in my own life. When you look at me tonight and you say, well, He's a godly man. He's He's a righteous man. Or if I look at you and say, she's a godly woman or a righteous woman, what I would say in that is that I know where it comes from. It doesn't come from us. It comes from who? God. So in pursuing, and keep on pursuing, we're pursuing His righteousness and godliness that comes through us, through Him. The second thing is found in that same verse also. It says we are to pursue and keep on pursuing faith and love. These two things are what comes out of us through the Spirit of God. So in other words, righteousness and godliness comes from God, but what comes out of us because of righteousness and godliness is what? Faith and love. Because He lives in us, and because He's part of us, we are able to practice our faith, but not only our faith, we are able to give love to people that don't deserve our love. And it only comes from who? It only comes from God. It can't come from us. We can't produce that. I can't make myself love Jackie Cole. I mean, as far as just make myself love him in a godly 
What, right? In a godly way. When I look at you and you look at me as brothers and sisters in Christ, we love each other because God first loved us. There's a third thing. Two words that come together. Did you, isn't it amazing how he puts these in categories together? Righteousness and godliness, faith and love. The third thing is patience and meekness. So first of all, we have that relationship that only comes from Him. We only get our righteousness and godliness from Him. And then out of that comes faith and love that comes out of us. And then also comes with that is our relationship with others. You see, this comes with our relationship with others, patience and meekness. I can have patience and meekness because of God's righteousness and His godliness that comes through me and the faith and love that He gives to me that comes out of me, it produces patience and meekness. I can be patient with you. And you can be patient with me. And I can be meek with you. And you can be meek with me. But not only just to Christians. Is everybody with me tonight? I, I, I'm not, I can not only be, you know, meek and patient with somebody that loves the Lord, but what he's saying to us is that this love is so true and so abounding in us, and this comes out of us so much that we can be that way with lost folks. Right. With folks that don't know Jesus Christ. You know, those folks in your family that you've witnessed to a hundred times. And they're still not getting it. And you don't understand how you're so patient with them and so meek and kind and, and that this faith that you have that God's going to do something. Where does it come from? Don't give yourself the honor for it. It don't come from you. It comes from God. And we need to honor God tonight knowing that this is where these things come from. When we get right with God, we'll be right with mankind. So we need to flee some things, and we need to follow after some things. And by the way, uh, these things don't just happen by showing up for worship on Sunday morning. You know, there's some that's been to church and, uh, for years and years, and they still lack a forgiving spirit. Uh, do you know anybody like that? Don't look at me like that. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, they've been in church for years and years and, and come to services for years, but they still lack that forgiving spirit and that gentle spirit. You want to know why? Because it only comes from God. We only get that from God. You don't produce that. In other words, you just can't wake up one morning and say, man, I'm just going to be a gentle, patient, meek person. You got to have some help. Yeah, amen. I know I need help. Amen? amen? Well, don't amen me. How about you? You need help. We need help. And it only comes from God. We can only have this forgiving spirit and gentle spirit from God. Listen, folks. People just don't stumble into godliness any more than they can stumble their way into heaven. Right? We can't. It's never going to happen. You have to go after it. You have to be in hot pursuit. You've got to want it. That's right. <laughs> Just like that player wants that touchdown. I mean, they, they sacrifice their bodies to get it. We need to sacrifice everything we are to be in hot pursuit of the calling of God. Amen. You don't hear much preaching like this, do you? We really don't. It's kind of, you know, anymore we, we hear this preaching on easy believism, you know, just get saved and everything's, you know, just, just, you just make it by, you know, just getting by. No, folks, God doesn't just want you to be getting by. He wants you to have something. 
So we need to flee from some things and follow after some things. But there is a third and final thing, and you're saying amen right there. And, and this is what it is. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 12. He says there, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now, the word fight there is from the Greek word, which means to agonize. Now, think about that, to agonize. You say, preacher, I, I don't really like that word, agonize. And I'm going to tell you why you don't like that word. Everybody listening to me? We don't like it because in our mind it speaks of struggling to strive. It, in the present tense there, here's what it means. It means fight and keep on fighting. We don't like to fight. Well, some of us don't. True. I mean, this world, it's true in this world. Some people like to fight. But as a man or woman of God, we shouldn't like to be in a struggle all the time when it comes to a physical struggle. But listen to me. We have to understand because we've been made meek and patient doesn't mean that we don't know how to fight spiritually. I think a lot of times in this old world, we get so mixed up, you know, we, we think we just need to be this little meek and mild person that never gets in any struggle. Folks, when you got saved, you begin a big struggle. And you better learn how to fight. We better learn how to, to fight the devil. Because he's coming after us. And he's going to whoop us if we don't watch out. So what God is saying here, when he says fight the good fight of faith, he's saying that we need to strive and we need to fight and keep on fighting in this spiritual struggle. When you put it all together, it means to agonize or struggle, the good struggle of faith. Now that sounds better, doesn't it? You see, there, there's, a, there's a struggle involved in becoming a man or woman of God. It's not easy. Listen, folks, when you get saved, you can't crawl in the corner somewhere and say, I'm saved, and I'm just going to hide here the rest of my life. Because, listen, the devil knows you're in that corner. He'll come after you there. we got to stand up and be counted. And say, not by my power, but by his power. We can win this thing. But we need to understand tonight, instead of thinking that we're these meek and mild people that, that never have to fight, we've got to understand spiritually, we have to fight. We have to fight for our godliness. We have to fight uh, to become more godly every day. Because the devil doesn't want that in your life. He doesn't want people to look at you and see a godly man or a godly woman. The, the struggle or the fight is not between the saints of God, or it shouldn't be. Uh, the struggle is between the forces of hell. That's who we're fighting. Every single day of our life, when you get up in the morning, there's going to be a fight. He's coming after you every single day. The devil. But you're well equipped. God has well equipped you for the fight. He's made you ready. He's given you His righteousness. He's given you His godliness. He's given you faith. He's given you the things, the tangible things that you need to get by every day. We just don't practice it. But we've got to start practicing our godliness because our fight's with the forces of hell. You may ask, well, how do I do that, preacher? How do I go about? Well, verse 12 gives us the answer. Look there in verse 12. I'm hurrying. I'm going to be done in just a moment. Verse 12 gives us the answer to how we fight. What does he say there in verse 12, 1 Timothy 6? He says, lay hold on what? 
eternal life. Lay hold on it. In other words, grab it. Christians, look at me. Listen to me. There is an eternal life in heaven with Jesus Christ. It's ours. Does everybody know that tonight? It's ours. It's paid for. It's ours. We get it. We won. The victory is ours, saith the Lord. It's ours. And God says while we're here on this earth and while we know we have His righteousness and we have His godliness and faith comes through Him and all these things, He said, here's what you need to do. Now just lay hold on eternal life. Believe it! You see, what happens, what the devil wants us to do, he wants to keep us down here all the time. He wants us to, keep, he, he wants us to think that this is our future, that, that this world is our future. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. This is not my future. <laughs> my future is in eternal life with him. But he'd like to keep, the devil would like to keep us thinking that way. But God says if you want to overcome these things and want to be a man or woman of God, lay hold on eternal life. Now those words, lay hold, means to get a grip on your eternal life. <laughs> That's where the title of the message came from. To get a grip on it. Get a grip on your eternal life. Now that's not talking about getting saved. Because he's talking to saved people here. It's talking about getting a good grip on what we already have in Christ. We let so much of our benefits go by with not even claiming them. Amen. And he's saying, I want you to claim them. I want you to have them. I, I want you to understand how to get them and how to live uh, uh, as a godly man and a godly woman. Claim what you have in Christ. Get serious about your relationship with Christ. Don't let your salvation grow stale and stagnant. Did you know in our day and time there are so many people that come to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and just go through that same routine that they do every Sunday and every Sunday night and, and their relationship has grown stale and, and stagnant. There's no joy, no happiness, no, no, no freshness to it. And the problem with a lot of people is they've gotten over getting saved. Amen. It's a truth. Amen. You remember when you first got saved, how happy you were? Do you remember going to work or school or wherever you went the next day and telling everybody, man, I got saved, I'm ready to go to heaven. I mean, you didn't care what they thought about you. You just knew that you were a child of God now, and it didn't matter to you. Who knew? It just seems like so many of us has just gotten over getting saved. What it means to be saved. Man, I am, I'm thankful I'm saved. I mean, you can lay down in bed at night. You know, when I was young, man, I didn't worry about that, but I'm 55, I'm old. Amen. You lay down in bed at night, you don't know if you're going to get up in the morning or not. But you know what? It don't matter to me, because I win either way. <laughs> Amen. I know that's an old saying, but it has a lot of good meaning, don't it? I'm saved. Am I always perfect? No. Are you? No. But are you saved? If you're saved, yes. That makes a world of difference, doesn't it? To know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. You can tell if people have let their salvation get a little stale. You say, well, preacher, how can I know? Here's how we can know. We can know if our salvation has gotten stale to us by our excitement about God. Have you 
checked your excitement level lately? You say, I don't know how to do that. Well, we don't have any problem in doing that when we go to these ball games. Amen. We find out real quick how excited we are. Or how unexcited we are. Right? Hey, I'm just as, hey, I do the same thing. You want to know how I know that's the truth? I, I do it myself. I put myself in that category. But what's happened to our excitement about God? Man, I'm telling you, we need to get excited about what God has done to us. How, how can we check? We check the level of our excitement, answer these questions. How many times in just the last few weeks have you talked to somebody about Jesus? Because when you talk to somebody about Jesus, that shows whether you're excited about him or not. Amen. Right? Now, I'm a preacher, and there's not many weeks that don't go by, many days that don't go by, that I don't talk to somebody about Jesus. But you know where I put myself in this category? I put myself in this category that it's not a set-up thing. You know, like somebody says, I want you to go talk to this one about Jesus. And I, I'm glad to do that. You know, I want to tell everybody about Jesus. My excitement level is... It's put to the test when I just see somebody at a restaurant or see somebody down the street or see somebody out in the yard, you know, and I tell them about Jesus. That's how I know if I'm excited about him. That it's not a set up thing. And that's not a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. If they get saved, praise God. Amen. So, to check your level of excitement... How many of you talked to about Jesus lately? How many do you talk about to about God in a day? I mean, just a conversation about God. A lot of us, you know, where we work. Oh, now, preacher, you just don't know. I can't talk about God. Well, you better talk about God at work. If you don't, who else is going to tell them about God? Huh? There is no problem with you smiling during the day and somebody saying, well, what are you smiling about? You can answer them. You can say, well, I'm smiling because God loves me and he's in my heart and I'm going to heaven. Yeah. And if a, if a principal comes to you, I call him principal, if the boss comes to you and say, why did you tell them about him? Well, they asked. That's right. why I was so happy and I just told them the truth. You want me to lie? No, I can't lie. I'm a Christian. I guarantee you you'd win in any court, any court with, that, with that argument. Last thing, how many times a week do you invite somebody to church? Hey, I got good news for you. I got you something right here. There you go. I'm going to see how many of those cards are going out there tonight. I'm going to see your level of excitement. <laughs> Right. I mean, really. If you love God and you love your church, and I know you do because you're here, then what would keep you from inviting somebody from coming to church? Well, I do that every day. Young and old. <laughs> Listen, folks. I don't care what you think, but you cannot keep quiet about the things of God if you love God. Let me ask you something. Let's just say that you walked out of the mall tomorrow night and you saw somebody, you know, a man with a paper bag in his hand and it looked like it had something in it. He's stumbling around the parking lot of the mall out there. What would you say about that man? you say, well, that man's drunk. You want to know why? Because what he got in that paper bag got into him, and when that got into him, it came out of him. So let me ask you something. When you got saved, did something get into you? Hey, we talk about the Holy Spirit all the time, don't we? Did the Holy Spirit get into you? So if the Holy Spirit is into you, shouldn't He come out of you? He don't want to stay there and hide in the corner of your heart. But we try to keep Him there. Oh, shh. 
I'm at work. Can't say nothing at work. I'm in the mall. Can't say Merry Christmas. Hey, Trump says you can say Merry Christmas and come in. <laughs> We've been saying Merry Christmas way before Trump said it. Right? <laughs> As a matter of fact, we're going to put it on this big sign real big, you know. Merry Christmas. I can't stand these places that put, well, not just that, but they never put Merry Christmas on nothing. They just have little stars and snowmen and, you know, they never say nothing about Jesus. Drives me crazy. And now they got a new name for Thanksgiving. What? Friendsgiving? Instead of Thanksgiving. Really, truly. I'm telling you the truth. The PC culture come out with that. Friendsgiving. Well, you don't have to call it Thanksgiving. You know, we're not going to give thanks for anything. Well, I won't get on my soapbox, but anyway. I'm going to give you two verses and then we're going to dismiss. You see, when you get into Jesus and Jesus gets into you, Jesus is going to come out of you. And the reason is because what's on the inside causes you to act the way you do. You say, how do you know that, preacher? Acts 4.13 says this. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge then that they had what? says for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard that's what happens when Jesus gets in you let's bow our heads tonight father we love you and we thank you Lord for the message you're so good and your word is so precious and we thank you father that you Give us these words in the Bible, these, these verses, these messages to teach us how to live a life that is godly, and how to grow and mature in you. You may be here tonight and God has spoke to you. And I just want you to know right now that this altar is open if you'd like to come. I don't know what you're praying about. That's between you and the Lord, but I do know this. If you think you need to come tonight, we're going to ask you to step out from where you are and come. Don't let this opportunity go by tonight without taking advantage of what God is doing in your heart. Would you come? You may be watching us by live stream tonight and God has touched your heart. God has shown you His Word and His Word has come alive in your heart. And maybe you're not saved. And maybe tonight is that night that God wants to save you. Maybe all you have to do is just ask Him to come into your heart. I'm going to say a little prayer with you tonight. If that's truth with you. And I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I'm lost. and I need you to save me. And I believe that you're the Son of God. And I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that on the third day you rose again. And I accept you as my personal Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. Now, I want you to know if you're watching by live stream and you prayed that prayer and you meant it, God saved you. We want to invite you to come to church. Those of you that are here tonight in the sanctuary, if God is speaking to you, would you come right now? We're going to dismiss in just a second.